those men who ate two to three servings of cooked tomatoes per week had a 30, up to a 30% reduction in the risk of developing prostate cancer, which depends upon angiogenesis. Now, what are the things that we know about dietary risk? We know that we're not eating enough nuts and seeds, fruits and vegetables, uh, low in omega-3 fatty acids, and we're eating too many processed foods like red meat and processed meats, and of course, uh, sugar-sweetened beverages. But that doesn't mean that this is the solution to health. Um, the solution is really coming out of economic drivers. So this is about two and a half trillion dollars of uh, burden that um, is attributed to some of these dietary risks. Diet isn't the full cause to these. There's uh, lots of other uh, things we've talked about, epigenetics, genetic uh, factors. There's other lifestyle issues, um, uh, stress, social issues that actually are uh, determinants of uh, health and disease as well. But I do think that we have to start here to th take a look at what we can actually do about it. Now, we are also not only interested in um, uh, our persons and our, our families and our communities, we're also interested in the planet. And in January of this year, the Eat Lancet Commission, which is an international coalition, uh, made a, uh, released a statement, a study that said basically in order to create to meet sustainability goals by 2050, we have to have the amount of red meat and sugar that we eat, and we have to double the amount of fruits and nuts and vegetables in order to be good not only for the person, but also for the planet. And this kind of just raised a whole other set of issues that in some ways are controversial, but also help to bring the focus of nutrition and food and health into clarity. You've got economics, you've got policy, global policy, you've got sustainability. So it's not just no longer about the person going up on the podium talking about a vegan diet. We're really talking about something that has true economic value and a driver uh, for opportunity as well. Now, different states now actually have food as medicine programs. Now, even though most of us here said, well, we're not really sure what that means, I can tell you that it's starting to be legislated. Uh, even insurance companies actually are beginning to talk about, you know, cancer protection in a bag. And so the vernacular of food as medicine is now actually starting to reach um, uh, the public and corporations. And it's also on Capitol Hill. There was a bipartisan announcement of the formation of a food as medicine working group within the Hunger Caucus that is now actually to talk about this issue uh, as well. And then finally, even the Vatican has gotten involved. This is actually from a conference that I um, uh, gave an address at talking about uh, uh, using diet to mobilize our defenses against the disease and a degrading environment. And so you can kind of see this is no longer really a bunch of extremists talking about vegan diets and at the salad bar. We're really talking about a kind of a global awakening and that's really what I want to uh, share with you is that this global awakening is going to drive things into the future. So what does that mean? Does that mean that we all just go to the veggie counter at the Whole Foods to be able to get um, a plate full of healthy foods? This is actually what most people think about as food as medicine. Let's, let's get rid of all the bad stuff. Let's pile up a bowl and let's go ahead and munch down. But if you think about it, this is a solution, but it's not the whole solution. And it can't be because there's a lot of science that is still unknown uh, that still needs to be unraveled about what it is about food. I mean, are there superfoods? Is there a super supplement? Probably not. There are no super drugs either. Uh, what we know is that the body actually is very complex and actually uh, uh, responds to foods on an individual as well as a systemic level in ways that we barely understand. So, while well, tomatoes actually have a lot of carotenoids, one of which is lycopene, well, lycopene inhibits angiogenesis in that red aortic ring assay, which I showed you earlier. Well, that's pretty cool. What could that actually possibly be useful for? Let's, let's jump back to the human studies. This is actually the health professionals follow-up study of 46,000 men, and it found that those men who ate two to three servings of cooked tomatoes per week had a 30, up to a 30% reduction in the risk of developing prostate cancer, which depends upon angiogenesis. And in fact, those men who did develop prostate cancer, when they looked deeply in the, tu in the tumor, this is molecular pathology, they actually found that the men who ate more uh, cooked tomato sauce actually had less, um, uh, fewer blood vessels, and also they also found that the tumors were less aggressive as well. And then the other question is dose. What's the best dose, right? Like, what, or what, what's the best source of lycopene? Well, it turns out not all tomatoes were equal. This is actually four types of tomatoes. Have you ever gone into the farmer's market or the grocery store in the summer, you saw all these different types of tomatoes. Wouldn't you want to know which one is the most potent? 
Well, I do. And this is why we started to take a look at which the li relative lycopene levels of different tomatoes. And these are just four of the cultivars or varietals that actually have the highest levels. Um, by the way, why do you have to cook the tomatoes? Because the to lycopene coming off of a, vi the vine, a tomato on a vine is actually in a chemical conformation your body can't absorb. When you heat it, the ideal way of heating is with olive oil, okay, not to boiling temperature, but simmering. So now think about Mediterranean cuisine. You change the chemical conformation into a form the body can absorb. So that makes a lot of sense. And we know that stem cells are called into action after injury. We know that the ba worse the injury, the more the stem cells uh, respond. We also know that aging slows down our stem cells. We heard about aging uh, the other day. And we also know that if you actually have lower stem cells, your chances of actually having a negative outcome of cardiovascular disease are worse. So what could you actually do to stimulate this besides going into clinical trials? Well, what about cacao? Studies have been done looking at chocolate, dark chocolate, the cacao, the polyphenols. And in fact, they've actually studied this um, by looking at 60-year-old men with cardiovascular disease and feeding them high polyphenol cacao. And a month later, you could double the amount of circulating stem cells in your circulation. It's not the final answer, but it's an amazing um, uh, point that you can actually do it. And they've studied this with larger numbers of people looking at lowering the incidence of, of heart disease as well. Omega-3 fatty acids also uh, can increase the activity of, of stem cells. A lot of these um, medications can stimulate. What about cancer stem cells? This is one of the most amazing things to me because there is it's a holy grail to find something that can kill a cancer stem cell, uh, which actually helps um, uh, tumors recur. Well, it turns out, that there are foods that inhibit cancer stem cells. And one of them, in fact, is the walnut. And this is a study from that was presented at ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, in which they looked at 800 patients with phase, uh, stage three colon cancer getting regular treatment, chemotherapy, and then found that those who ate two or more servings of tree nuts a week, including walnuts, had a 50%, 53% improvement in survival and a 66% reduction in cancer recurrence after surgery. Why does that happen? Look at this. Look at this Kaplan-Meier curve. It's pretty amazing. Um, if you had a drug that could do this, um, added on top of the treatment, you would actually call this something that definitely should be explored further. How does that work? Well, it looks like when you extract something, uh, the polyphenols from walnuts, you can actually kill colon cancer stem cells. Amazing. So again, biotech informing us. I want to just close quickly by showing you just a, a snippet of what the microbiome and immune system can actually do. 37 trillion bacteria in our bodies associated with all kinds of chronic diseases that we don't really have good answers for, clearly are connected. Um, how do we treat our microbiome? Well, we can feed the bad bugs, we can give the bugs and avoid things that can hurt the bugs. Here are things that are some surprises. Kiwi fruit is prebiotic. When you actually do small pilot studies you can and give female volunteers kiwi fruit, you increase their beneficial bacteria um, by 30% in the first day uh, and, and another type uh, over the course of about four days. These are the foods that you can actually eat to actually consume bacteria. I'm not going to go into that in detail. And sourdough bread actually uh, also contains uh, a lactobacillus ruteri that is used to make the dough sour. Now, what's really amazing is that this same bacteria used for sourdough can inhibit the growth of breast cancer. And the activity of lactobacillus doesn't require live bacteria. If you fragment them and sonicate them, the particles will actually have the same effect. This is actually showing a, a mouse study with a healthy diet and breast tumors. A fast food diet speeds up the growth of, of breast cancer. But then you add the probiotic lactobacillus ruteri in the drinking water and let them eat a fast food diet, you decrease the risk that you decrease the, the, the growth, the speed of breast cancer growth. A lot of foods affect the microbiome.